Coming up on Techzilla, Snow Leopard is Apple's latest OS worth upgrading to. Spotify, possibly the future of online music listening. Build a NAS with leftover hardware, wipe a drive, and rechargeable battery 101. Pour yourself a fresh cup of coffee and grab a seat, because Techzilla starts now. This episode of Techzilla is made possible by Frost Brewed Coors Light, the world's most refreshing beer. GoDaddy and Squarespace. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Veronica Belmont. Welcome to Techzilla, hands-on reviews of the latest tech and how to make the most out of the gear you already got. Whether you're a beginner tech support for your friends and family, if you've got a question about tech or need a good recipe for meatloaf, we've got an answer for you. At least I have an answer. You're not a big meatloaf person. You always have the answer. Like you don't? Sometimes. And Not meat to meatloaf, loaf, though. Thumbs up or thumbs Swedish down? Swedish meatballs, maybe. Ooh. With grape jelly. Actually, what we need is a hands-on demo of making Swedish meatballs with our very own Veronica Belmont. That's coming up later in the show, along with <laughs> Apple's <laughs> latest, yeah. Snow Leopard. Arr. The Arr. cat is out of the bag, as it were. Yeah, well, you know what? Normally we get kind of ridiculous. You know what? I'm not going to tell you a thing about Snow Leopard, because Roger Chang has upgraded this weekend, and he's going to give you the full scoop on his experience. Oh, good. I'm glad he did it so I didn't have to. <laughs> I was going to, but my, my uh, as, I, as I've told you guys probably many times, the DVD drive on my MacBook Pro is broken. Mm -hmm. So I need to either find an external DVD drive or install from Two. an external drive via disk image. So I might try that later tonight. We'll see how it Get goes. I've heard so many problems from people who have been installing Snow Leopard. Or like, like if you try to upgrade Firefox or, yeah. Well, you know, you know what the thing, you ever see the pictures, like you're watching the Animals Eating Animals channel and there's mm -hmm. like 4,000 penguins around a hole in the ice and they're all looking at the a hole in the ice and then finally like one of the penguins pushes another penguin in. <laughs> and then they all wait to see if there's like a giant horrible Chewing is Roger the, the penguin? Walrus. Are you calling Roger Roger's the penguin? Roger's our penguin. Roger's the first <laughs> penguin in. <laughs> <laughs> Break your own computer. We'll see how it goes. So, no, yeah. I've heard good and bad. I've heard good and bad. But there have been some interesting problems that people have come across. But that's always going to happen when you're doing a major say, more kind or of upgrade. less than any other version of OS X in the last uh, few years. The same, I'm yeah. sure. It's just a different set of problems, it seems. Yeah, it was, we got an email this morning from our from our CTO. It's like, if you're considering upgrading to Snow Leopard and you work on the video production in our facility, don't, because there's significant changes to QuickTime mm -hmm. oh, that we're quick impacting our production one. model. You know what I'm bummed production about tools. is that I finally got Glimms all set up and running on Safari, and I'm loving it, and I'm totally used to it, and everyone recommended it to me, and you guys did a wonderful job because I'm really enjoying it. And then it doesn't work on Snow Leopard. Aww. It doesn't work on Snow Leopard, so until they do an upgrade for Glimms, the plugin for Safari, I'll have to go without, I guess. Speaking of upgrades, yeah. and, uh, uh, I'm not actually <laughs> doing this as an advertisement for GDGT.com, which is <laughs> her boy's website uh, with Peter Rojas. I made a phone call this morning. Peter Rojas not being the boy, by the way. I right. just want to make that clear. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's <laughs> not even get into the whole subject of you and your boyfriend. Um, Boyfriends, plural? Well, the, remember the thing on the show? Oh, and the, the, yeah, yeah, it's not. Anyhow, so I made a phone call this morning that lasted like all the way from my house to work, and it didn't drop out once. Ah, so you think they're adding more cells, or well, what's the deal? Well, supposedly, right, so AT, we whine about AT&T a lot because their service is problematic here in San Francisco and in New York and pretty much everywhere else, but they're, they, AT&T is supposedly migrating to the 850 megahertz bandwidth. They've, they've bought a bunch of companies just to get access to 850 megahertz bandwidth, which works a lot better over distances. Um, so it's either that or the fact that I had problem. my GPS died on, on my iPhone mm -hmm. and it was still under warranty so I was allowed to trade it for a refurbished iPhone. So I'm not sure if it was, it was the, the physical hardware problem that was causing all my mm -hmm. dropped calls, but I noticed actually this morning was I was certain actually that they must be doing something with the towers because I've never in the history of using AT&T had this one particular section of road not drop out. We had so reception at the Revision 3 studios today, I noticed, when I was in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And I've never had reception in the building here. Well, you could kind of get it on the, by the one window if you held it up here. Oh, so maybe I was just on the right corner of the office. No, no, no. If, if your nose was on the window class by Jim's desk, <laughs> that was where AT&T worked in our offices. Well, I had a lot of people emailing me asking me specifically if you had seen an improvement in your AT&T service over the past couple weeks. I, well, I've, I've, I've said two sets of improvement. Like I said, my, 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 we, I purchased the new TomTom program, the $100 GPS program, and it would not 
I couldn't get a GPS signal. So you for figured it. it was your your GPS antenna, which made no and well, there's no real antenna. It's just like the chip down in there. And so I, I, so they were like, okay, that's a hardware failure. They swapped out the phone for me, and that fixed. And then like, so because I was I was in and out of town for the last couple mm -hmm. weeks or the last week, and I was in town and I had the epic call fail in that section of road, and then got back in town four days later and did not have the call fail in that section of road. Very so I think AT and T is rolling out the new new bandwidth, which would be really nice. Well, we'll be talking more about Apple and particularly Snow Leopard later on in the show, so hang tight. Uh, but first, I think it's time to help someone in need. Our first question of the day comes from Alex. He writes in, I have a couple of Macs, a couple of PCs, a compact laptop, and a very old Advent laptop on my home network. The oldest PC is running XP. Can I set up the XP machine as a file server for the rest of the network computers? If I can, how do I do it? I'm trying to reuse all the computer stuff I have rather than shell out for a NAS or a Drobo. I don't mind Ubuntu or Unix distros if they are required as I run them on my old laptop. Alex in England. We love it when people recycle PCs and keep them out of landfills. Yeah, that's the worst, just throwing away an entire PC like that. It's not gonna, <laughs> it's not gonna compost well, I'll it's tell you that much. Not, it's not gonna compost at all. <laughs> well, and that was a joke. There's, Thanks, some, pretty well, there's <laughs> some pretty gnarly stuff in the motherboard yeah, it's itself. Not good. Look, you can you can donate it, you can sell it to or sell it to sell it to a recycler. You can pay a recycler to recycle it, you can give it to an organization that recycles them. Just don't throw them in the garbage if you can. Go out of your way to try to figure out a way to recycle or refurbish that box. Yeah, um, rip them apart and sell the parts if you can. I mean, something's got to be useful in there, right? Or is it just way too old? Maybe <laughs> if you cases, had them in bulk. Yeah, yeah. If, if you have like a thousand machines at your corporation, it's a lot easier to sell those than it is to sell a, the parts from a single box. Unless yeah. you're selling it on Craigslist or something like that. Uh, nice thing is, though, it's really easy to turn your old machine into a really, really useful network attached storage machine because servers generally don't require a lot of CPU power or a huge amount of memory. It's not like you're trying to run Amazon.com. You're just trying to spit some bits out over your home network. FreeNAS is the classic. It is an open source freeware distro that turns a PC into an FTP, a Samba, an AFP server, and a NAS box, any or all of the above. System episode 60 will walk you step by step through installing and configuring FreeNAS. It's pretty painless and it's pretty cool once it's done. Yeah, and what about um, Unraid? That's another free one, Unraid's right? Unraid's relatively new. It's from a company called Lime Technology. It boots off of a USB flash drive and then lets you mix and match drives of different sizes. Mm. It's specifically designed for NAS boxing, and they call it Unraid because you can mix and match drives of different sizes. Most RAIDs require you to have the exact the same, same drive in right. the exact right. So it's similar to a Drobo, but there's no striping of parity data. If you want to recover from a dead hard drive, you have to dedicate a single drive to store all the data off of the other drives. Okay. All the parity data is, is stored on a single drive. So the free version supports up to three drives, the $69 plus version supports up to six drives, and it also adds controls for user level permissions. Um, and, and basically Unraid is designed to do one thing well. It's, it supports the SMB network protocol and nothing else. Um, but one thing people have noticed, if you think of RAID as being a way to serve data and not as backup storage, you should always have your RAID stuff backed up on another. I was like reading somebody's rant, like, RAID is not long-term storage. And I'm like, well, it is in my house. Um, but if you if you dump the parity drive, uh, Unraid can operate really, really fast if you have a need to move data around your, your network super, super fast. System 108 will walk you through the complete process of installing and configuring Unraid. Yeah, and some things you want to keep under consideration. Uh, you'll want to get large, preferably durable drives. There's no point in recycling old hard drives if they only hold 40 or 80 gigabytes. Unless all the PCs in your house have like 20 or 40 gigabyte hard drives. Uh, which case we suggest you upgrade, it'll change your life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then power usage, if you're sensitive about energy usage, some older machines might chew more power than a newer micro ATX board, uh, recycled notebook, or dedicated NAS appliance. So there's lots of info available, so definitely read up and see what fits best for you. Yeah, and I gotta say, the whole power, a lot of people who like are, are very against converting old PCs into servers, it's less about Why, the hardware. Cause, well, because the power consumption. All right. You know what I mean? If you're talking about like, a, you know, if you've got a 300 watt power supply and it's not very, you know, not very efficient, and it's like leaving 300 watt bulbs running 24 7. Ah, that's true. You know what I mean? So the, the whole idea is that for some people it's like it's a dramatic waste of electricity. I think it's, you know, it's better to use a little more electricity than it is than to throw out an entire. Yeah, or go through the manufacturing cost of creating an entire new device. Like how many, you know what I mean? Like when they do the thing, like it takes 10,000 gallons of fresh water and 42 million volts of electricity to create a single car, you know, by used. So I want to figure out like how much 
electricity and materials and like, you know, yeah. How many BTUs does it take to build a single NAS box or something? I bet it probably takes more to build one than to use one. Yeah, or and like how many years of electricity? One. Yeah, it's, it's, I'm getting green all of a sudden <laughs> for a moment. Still to come, Snow Leopard. Is this the best OS 10 ever or is it something you might want to pass on? Find out, but first, while we got your attention, let's take a moment to thank one of our sponsors. How do you get your beer cold certified? Check out the Project Cold experiments at CoorsLight.com slash Project Cold. Just click on experiments at the top to see all the ways guys have created to chill a beer quickly. You can vote on whether their methods are cold certified and share them on Facebook. There are also Know Your Cold animations that give you tips on how to get and keep your beer cold. And they've got tips on packing for a tailgater, fridge and freezer fundamentals, or creating an ice bath with your washing machine just in time for your Labor Day party. At Coors Light, they've made cold beer their policy. All Coors Light cans are now cold activated. So when the mountains turn from white to blue, you know your beer is as cold as the Rockies. So check out CoorsLight.com slash Project Cold and support Texilla by supporting our sponsors. Welcome to this week's freebie download pick, a free program that we find useful, fun, or incredibly interesting. This week, Project Dog Waffle 1.2. If you're serious about trying your hand at artistic painting but can't afford the material, space, or the mess, consider Project Dog Waffle. A freeware paint and simple animation tool, Project Dog Waffle lets you explore your skill with a variety of tools that mimic real canvas and easel painting, like customizable brushes, textures, filters, effects, multiple, and color selection options. Dog Waffle also includes basic animation tools that are more than enough to accomplish most non-professional animation work. Dog Waffle only supports bitmap and target image formats, so be ready to convert your final work into something more Flickr friendly. And while it does lack the scripting and capabilities of its pay-for bigger brother Project Dog Waffle Pro 4, Dog Waffle 1.2 does support plugins and the site provides several helpful tutorials for simple projects. So if you're looking for a way to turn your PC screen into a digital canvas, you should definitely try out Project Dog Waffle 1.2. Our intrepid OS 10 penguin has emerged from the icy waters of the Antarctic, carrying with him OS 10 10.6 and his decision about whether or not it was worth his money to upgrade. Here joining us is our penguin slash guinea pig slash producer, Mr. Roger Chang. Hello. You were really, I've never seen you excited enough to go out and buy an, an operating system of any type the day it was released. I think it was because it was 30 bucks and I wanted to see what you got for 30 bucks. So 30 bucks for the single user upgrade, 50 bucks for the five license family yeah, upgrade. The family pack. The family pack. What's the biggest change? Biggest change, uh, PowerPC app. Mm -hmm. If you got G5 earlier, PowerPC process or anything, forget it. Part of the Apple tradition. What about you know basically culling all the older hardware? What about the security changes? Security. That's something you've been banging a drum. It's more secure. Okay. A lot of security experts for for years since OS 10 releases, you know, it's fundamentally an insecure system. There are issues that any uh, you know moderate to advanced hacker could take advantage of. Uh, Apple has said that they've you know kind of tied up those loose ends. Some others, you know, a lot of other security experts says you've only done half the job, you still have the other half to complete uh, with any either subsequent updates or patches or, or both. So we're talking about like bover, buffer over, bover buffer flows, buffer overflows, any, any uh, other big They things? have, uh, they, yeah, they included a new malware uh, detection in built into the OS to detect to see if there's any malware or Trojan identified by signature by Apple, so you have to update it. Will it remove the malware or just waves uh, for, a flag from, that from what, if So far, all I understand that it just raises a flag. It will not remove it like an antivirus or, or uh, uh, delete it the same way. Interesting. What, what, are, what other big things are, are coming up with the new so, version you know, Snow Leopard? The 32-bit, 64-bit, a lot of people are saying Snow Leopard is going to be the first 64-bit top-to-bottom mm -hmm. OS that you'll ever see and only by Apple. Um, it was it was kind of beaten into our heads for the past six you know half six months. I sense the snarkometer going off here. Well, as as it is currently, it's a 32-bit OS by default when you boot it when you boot the consumer version of OS 10 right. Snow Leopard. Um, you can force it if you have one of the few machines that supports. There's the like five machines yeah, actually five fully support it. Yeah, it fully supports 64-bit OS yeah. 10. Uh, Unibody MacBook Pros, uh, iMacs. Uh, some of the Mac, uh, the newer Mac Pros. Um, even then, though, it defaults to 32-bit. You have to hold down the six and the four key. Every boots. time you start it. To boot. 
Or I'm sure you could write a script to do it for you, but <laughs> you, 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 you have to do that. So basically, um, I guess Apple figured most machines aren't going to be running massive amounts of memory that yeah. takes advantage of a 64-bit operating system. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, the, the, the four gigabyte limit is really the, the, the attraction of 64-bit uh, 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 memory um, addressing. So <laughs> as, as of now... Your machine will only load three gigabytes of memory anyway. You know, an Apple spokesperson in Australia said that, you know, it doesn't really matter. You can still run 64-bit applications on 32-bit uh, kernel. I Mate. Know, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't seen it. So, you know, I don't have any 64-bit applications, so I can't really test that out. It sounds like it's time to go straight to the shiny. Yes. So, you know, one of the few things they did was improve mail, uh, which they cut down the amount of bloat. They've included Microsoft Exchange out of the box. Cool. So if you live on stuff like that, which I don't, I guess that's cool. If you're a business user. <laughs> uh, one of the cool things with the DocUI is now that they you can force uh, icons, uh, win multiple windows to live within their respective icons. Oh, cool. So instead of dumping additional icons onto the dock, you can basically select an individual yeah. icon and see all the instances. For whatever application those windows are for. Oh, that's for. cool. That's so it kind cool. of rationalizes everything. And in fact, it's kind of what Windows 7 and Vista do. But. <laughs> Um, some other awesome things that you can check out are in the system preferences. Now, uh, the system preferences includes a lot of new uh, shiny shinies, including you know appearance, uh, which they basically removed the font smoothing options, which really doesn't <laughs> matter to me. Um, desktops, they included a bunch of new pictures, if you're really into Apple pictures. So there's so little going on with OS X, you have already resorted four and a half minutes in the, into the review of talking about wallpaper for the desktop. Oh, fine, 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 <laughs> fine, 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 fine. All right, so we go into the desktop or uh, folder view, and one of the cool things is if you go into icon view, you can now make your icons super, super gargantuan. Oh, my goodness. Or if you want, you super tiny. But, <laughs> you know, that's, again, this is kind of one of the uh, flourishes that they've done to kind of spruce up the, uh, the UI. Now, one of the interesting things is that with all these applications, before when you used to go to services, it would have something in there, but it didn't really matter what it was because it was kind of useless. Now, anything that's in services is kind of context-based to the application. Oh, interesting. So whether or not the application can use it. Since so it's instead really, of seeing that weird generic stuff that didn't make sense in any application. Yeah, now you go quick uh, services, now you, you know, unfortunately these don't have anything useful. <laughs> hey, wait a minute, is that the new version of QuickTime? Yes, this is QuickTime 10 or X. And what they've done is they've taken QuickTime and they've basically cut off all the legacy stuff that they didn't want. They felt was holding it back, causing too much bloat. Um, they focus more on the HD, more on the user interface, uh, a lot more functionality than the just standard QuickTime player. Wow. Uh, for example, right now I have this video and I can actually trim it. Oh, so, cool. So if I want to, I only want this clip, I can just select it here. Now, suppose I want to share this video. So you got to watch this video. I can share it through as soon as it stops and let me cancel out trim. I can now share it through iTunes, Mobile Me, or YouTube. Can you capture video also? You can capture video. You can either capture video through a US connected USB uh, webcam, in this case, the iSight that I have right here. Uh, I can capture screen, so I can do a screen capture recording. Oh, so no, basically no longer having to use No third-party third party. applications. Uh, what you lose, though, is a lot of the compatibility and export options that you had um, with the earlier QuickTime. So if you're like into video editing, um, you would kind of want to make sure you have some sort of version of Pro. I had QuickTime Pro because I had Final Cut installed, mm -hmm. and what happens is QuickTime 7 is installed, giving you those options to export and uh, various video options. So it seems like, as always, research your favorite or most important applications before you upgrade to a new operating yeah. system. And the rest of, I mean, this is just some of the features that mm -hmm. they've added. There's a few more. It's very uh, incremental. It's very incremental. It's a lot of polish. It's basically a lot of polish. A lot of the work that that's gone on with Snow Leopards actually happened under the hood. Uh, they implemented new developer tools like uh, OpenCL, which allows developers to take advantage of the GPU mm -hmm. uh, and give it other tasks other than graphics, in the same way that uh, NVIDIA is pushing CUDA to do general purpose computing on their GPUs. So I'm, I'm, I'm guessing here this is not something that everybody should rush out and go buy immediately. Um, you know, maybe for the security, but you know, other than that, you know, if you're happy with where you are and you take the, the, the standard precautions when you surf online about opening attachments. You know, even though it's OS 10, there are, you know, there is vulnerabilities. Malware. <laughs> there's malware, there's vulnerabilities, and you, gotta, you want to be aware of that. 
Um, but is it something you should start run, run out and pay 30 bucks for if you don't see a compelling need like uh, OS, uh, not OS QuickTime? Well, if you 10. constantly record videos on your eyesight camera, you may be looking at this going like, I've been waiting for that feature yeah. forever. Um, you know, I haven't noticed any real speed up in UI, so if you're expecting that, it's probably not gonna happen. It's a little, it's pared down a lot of the bloat. So if you feel that your install is a little fat, um, you might want to go to it, but you can actually do the same thing by reinstalling OS X. So it sounds like a thumbs up, but no need to rush. Yes. And you know what? If you're going to be picking up a new uh, Mac within, before the end of the year, you might as well just wait. <laughs> to get to doing, yeah. 30 bucks for an individual license, 50 bucks for the household license for five clients. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Roger Chang, our intrepid penguin. Coming up next, we're going to be talking about viewer questions, but right now, GoDaddy.com, people. If you want to make an impact online, GoDaddy.com is what you need. .com names for as low as $1.99, plus world-class hosting, fast and easy website filters, and quite a bit more. GoDaddy.com makes it easy to customize your own virtual dedicated server, choose one of three popular plans, or select your own Linux or Windows server with all the plan options you need. Enter in code TECH2, that's T-E-K-2, when you check out, you'll save an additional 5 bucks off any order of $30 or more. Storm restrictions apply. See the site for details and be sure to check out revision3.com slash GoDaddy for all the Techzilla GoDaddy deals and codes. Do us a favor here at Techzilla. Get your piece of the internet at GoDaddy.com and use one of those TEK codes when you do. Looks like it's time for another website we just can't get enough of. A website that we just can't stay away from because it's too useful, too funny, or just too darn irresistible. This week's pick, Screen Toaster. Have you ever needed to show someone how to do something on a computer, but it's just a little too complicated to explain over email or the phone? How about making them a screencast to show them exactly how it's done? This is, of course, assuming you don't already have Snow Leopard. With Screen Toaster, you can make a screencast from your web browser without having to download any extra software. Best part? It's totally free. Here's how it works. Create an account on Screen Toaster and then fill in the settings you want. Then just head over to the web page that you want to record and hit Alt-S to start the recording. Or of course hit the giant red button. Hit Alt-S again to stop once you've got everything you need. They have a set of tools for basic editing and you can even use the geek mode to access some advanced options. Like being able to record over VPN or changing the bitrate of the recording. Once you have your screencast to your liking, you can share it or embed it on your favorite social networks like Facebook or YouTube. Or just save it to your computer as an MOV or flash file. So the next time you want to show instead of tell, send them a Screen Toaster video instead. We mentioned Spotify briefly in our interview with Tom Conrad from Pandora a few weeks ago, but only our listeners in the UK and Europe have had the chance to try the service without a special invite. Luckily for this guy, they've been sending out invites here and there across the US in the past couple of weeks, and I was lucky enough to be able to test out the service. Uh, Spotify is a music streaming service with over one million registered users overseas. Uh, the company functions by making licensing deals with major labels and offers a free ad-supported version and a paid subscription service as well. It's peer-to-peer -peer and client -based not browser-based like Pandora. The streaming tracks are all Ogvorbis, but they've got the RM on them, so you can't save anything to your computer. It's um, so weird. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> However, they do show options for buying the tracks with suggested retailers. Um, obviously, I'm running the US version of the app here, um, so things are a little different from what our UK viewers are probably accustomed to. Although I'm not 100% sure. I don't know if I'm really seeing the full offerings here if they've just selected certain things for wanna, the US. I just want to know if the Bon Jovi album is still showing up there and if that's like on the front page of the UK version. No, they've got that Bon Jovi there right there. We weren't born to follow 2009. So this also, how is this, I, I, I don't get it. It's like, it's not, I. It, what is it? What does it do? How do you discover music? What makes it so amazing? Because you've actually been excited about this. Yeah, I have been excited about this. I but think I it's a really out great what way. what it does. <laughs> well, what do you want to know? Everything. Everything. Okay. Where do we start? <laughs> well, um, I was initially a little concerned about the music selection because I wasn't seeing anything from independent labels, but I think that's just my personal taste. Um, but as you dig a little bit deeper, you do find things that are mainstream, but also really cool to listen to. Like I found a lot of stuff by The Cure and New Order, so there's definitely like mainstream stuff. I, I went way mainstream 80s with this for my playlists. Something. I'm not exactly sure what deals they've worked out with the US subsidiaries of the various labels that they've worked with in the UK and overseas, um, but it does seem that the selection is smaller than that mm -hmm. of our European counterparts, which have almost four million tracks available wow. um, as of this this current date for streaming. The interface is super cool though. Um, as you can see right here, you've got your home screen that shows your top list, what's new, Miley Cyrus, party in the USA, yay. 
<laughs> um, you can see what tracks and albums are popular, make playlists and searches to save for later. As you can see here, as I mentioned, I've got my Cure and New Order searches. Or you can simply listen to the radio, which is right here, by selecting which uh, genres you want to listen to and then the, uh, the dates that you want to search through also. So you can listen to alternative punk between the 70s and today, which I thought you might be particularly um, interested in hearing, I'm, Patrick. I'm tempted slash frightened to see what shows up on the list. Yeah, it seems <laughs> to be a mixture. It's not like you're whittling down the selection mm -hmm. when you search alternative and punk. So if I add blues to that mix, it's not going to be genres that only fall under like alternative X. blues <laughs> punk. Yeah, pretty much. Um, it does all those genres. So you can have a really interesting combination and mix of music when you want when you want to listen to the radio. Um, I like making the playlist a lot. Um, I made an alternative playlist with The Offspring and Green Day, and uh, <laughs> Black Hole be... Sun and Black Sabbath. So it's sort of alternative <laughs> slash grunge. Yeah, and the best part is there's like zero buffering. Uh, there's a local really? cache of uh, one gigabyte, and the tracks are uh, they start almost instantly. This so is it's a like plus. it's like playing iTunes. It's not really like playing something streaming and having to wait for a long time for it to buffer. So this seems like something that's a little bit iTunes, a little bit Last SM, and a little bit Pandora, and a little bit Rhapsody and Amazon Music Store and is it is it how is it just, so basically it's it's another option for purchasing and owning tunes with yet another format of DRM is it pretty what? much yeah i mean it's got the iTunesness of it where you can find a lot of mainstream tracks and find a lot of different music by based on recommendations uh -huh. from other people. It has a social networking aspect of it built in as well. You can scrabble your tracks to last.fm um, under the settings. So you can see my where your location is for your cache. Oh look you can you can use at most I didn't realize you could do this. You can uh, pull up your your cache. I thought it was only one gigabyte but apparently it starts at ten and oh, really? you can go up from there. That's a good thing. Yeah, it's got uh, proxy detection, last out of him scrobbling, and uh, sound normalization, a lot of different settings that you can go that through as well. That could be really well. useful when you're using a lot of tracks from a lot of different sources, being able to normalize them and not blow right. your ears out. Right, right. That's definitely true. I mean, if you're listening to something from the 70s and then you go into something more <laughs> modern day, there might be a little bit of difference in the, in the, in the volume there. I don't even know. It could be painfully know. different. Yeah, things, things change over time. Things change from album to album, even from the same artist. So, uh, I, 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 so I can see it's another avenue for this. The, the only downside I, could, a downside I can see from this is if you purchase the tunes, they are definitely going to have DRM on them? So yeah, you can't actually purchase yet in the U.S. It's only available in like four or five countries over Europe and the U.K. So can you, I wonder if, uh, yeah, so you, I wonder if, I guess you can't, you won't be able to find out. So d would you like be able to purchase from the Amazon store or iTunes or? That's what I'm guessing. I think it probably sends it either to iTunes or some other music retailer. I'm not sure if you can purchase it directly through Spotify or not. I'll have to double check on that one. Um, but the selection is really good. You know, I, looking through this more, I think this is the full, probably the full selection that they've got over there for testing purposes. And uh, it's available on Mac, PC, Linux, and uh, free BSD over Wine. Interesting. So yeah, it runs on, on pretty much every platform you could possibly want it to. If you could only per like, if you only had access to one music service, and assuming this was the full version mm -hmm. of it, would this be the one? Um, I mean, I guess. Yeah, it would either be this or iTunes for me. I, I mean, I use eMusic to mm -hmm. get DRM-free tracks, and I get DRM-free tracks off of iTunes. So as long as I would have some kind of DRM-free option option when downloading music off of Spotify or from their partners, then I would probably do that. That would be pretty cool. Yeah, but I just love doing the searches and, and finding music on there. Like, I've had a really fun time rocking out to my old school alternative tracks from 1994. <laughs> it's made me pretty happy. I think, mean, like, the first time yeah. I played around with, like, Rhapsody and, it was, and when it was the monthly unlimited cap, that was, like, mm -hmm. a really mind-blowing thing. Like, oh, wow, I haven't thought about Steve Woodwood in 10 years. And I'm, like, all of a sudden, like, you know, I'm listening to the high spark of, low yeah. spark of high-heeled voice. But it's a, a an album I don't think I would ever buy, but it's a song I love to listen to. Yeah, I forgot to check on that. So any of our UK or European uh, <laughs> listeners who know how they purchase music through Spotify, if it's directly through Spotify or, or through um, third-party retailers or vendors or whatever it is, uh, let us know. I'll double check after the show, but if you want to chime in and talk about how you like to buy your music with Spotify, let us know. Um, overall, I'm really looking forward to the U.S. release of this product. I'm hoping they add more independent labels and uh, tracks to their catalog, but right now I'm having a lot of fun, like I said, listening to the stuff that's on there already. Um, this is going to be a game changer, I think, for the industry when it gets here. It's already making more money for Universal in Sweden than iTunes is. Huh. 
So I don't know how big I of a music why market. That is. Maybe because they buy Sweden directly has, from the I Universal store. It's a lot. Yeah, who knows? I mean, Universal artists are doing better on Spotify than on iTunes. Is this a is this like a is this like the RAA putting this tool together and beta testing it in Europe before they bring it to the US? Well, there Who's are there are partnerships with the labels. It is brought to us in part by those major labels. So that this are is their tool for a to solution. break the back of Apple's iTunes store. But hey, if they're doing such a freaking good job of it, I'm not complaining, oh, you I'm know? not complaining either, but it's it's interesting cuz it's I know a lot of the record labels are looking for a way to to sell music mm -hmm. that doesn't involve having to bend over to Steve Jobs on knee, of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, asking him politely to help them make more money. Mm -hmm. Right, coming up, your questions on rechargeable batteries and wiping it dry before you sell your old PC and hopefully no more awkward pauses. But first, let's take a moment to thank one of our sponsors, Squarespace. Here to tell you more is our PA, Annie. Hi everyone, it's me, Annie. If you want to create a kick-ass website or spice up the one you already have, look no further than squarespace.com. With Squarespace, you're not limited by cookie cutter designs or clumsy code. You have complete control over the look and feel of your site. Now, last week I got the idea to make a website that aggregates just the uplifting, empowering, happy news stories from every cycle and called it Just the Good News. With Squarespace, I was able to set up a simple interface where I repost all the good news that I come across along with category indexes so viewers can browse the stories based on type, medical miracles, tearful reunions, heroic feats, stuff like that. From there, I wanted to create a few different ways for people to subscribe and participate. So I set up a contact form for feedback, an RSS option, and links to Twitter so that visitors can receive a little sunshine in their media feed if they so choose. What's great about using Squarespace is that you don't have to deal with a single inch of programming code or any third-party plugins ever. Everything you need is right there and can be accessed or changed with the click of a mouse. No code, no headaches, no experience necessary. Once I've set up the site, I can track what content is most popular, where my views are coming from, and who's subscribing. Better yet, you can sign up for a free trial today at squarespace.com. And for all you Techzilla viewers, using the code TechZ, that's T-E-K-Z, gets you 10% off the whole lifetime of your order if you sign up for the paid version of Squarespace. All that, plus the satisfaction of keeping Techzilla on the air. So if you're looking to start a website, you definitely want to check out squarespace.com first. All right, time for some more viewer questions. Uh, first up, Patrick, you are responsible for some pain and suffering in Canada. Excuse me? Trevor writes in, I've been trying to follow Patrick's example and convert all the batteries in my house from alkaline to rechargeable. All the rechargeable batteries I can find are rated at 1.2 volts and not the standard 1.5 volts. Yep. I'm finding that the rechargeable batteries don't have the necessary power for the devices to work properly. This problem can be seen in everything from a baby swing to a stereo TV remote. How did Patrick overcome this issue? You, and what would you suggest so that I can do my part in returning us to a greener planet? Well, uh, you can go to a pastoral existence, stop consuming electricity, stop driving a car, eat vegetables. and I, th I think he's talking about batteries specifically. Oh, okay. So well, okay, look, I'm thinking you're looking at the packages and not actually buying and using the batteries. Or your gear is a lot more sensitive to voltage variations than mine is. Pretty much all nickel metal hydrides run at 1.2 volts, whether they're Energizers or PowerX or whoever, Duracell is another big brand. And at home, we use them at digital cameras, remote controls, toys, and yes, the dreaded diesel powered baby <laughs> swing that could kill a set of six fresh alkalines every two days. Those babies run through those things like milk. Let me tell you something, if you're, if you're pro baby whatever swing. Whatever babies run through quickly, I don't know, I just made that up. If, <laughs> that's how we keep. Seamus active all the time. Yeah. Fresh batteries. Rechargeables. Yeah. Well, <laughs> here's the thing, though. As batteries drain, though, whether it's the lead acid battery in your car, the lithium ion battery in your notebook, or the alkalines or nickel metal hydrides in your digital camera, or whatever, the voltages start at a certain level and they drop as the charge depletes over time. Some devices might refuse to run with a battery that's 1.2 volts or lower, but I haven't seen that problem too often and I haven't seen it at all recently. By the way, I haven't had a chance to try them out myself, but the folks at Gizmodo found Duracell's rechargeables lasted twice as long in the tactical flashlight as energizers, despite having a lower milliamp rating on the box. Like I think the Duracells rate themselves at 2,000 milliamps, and the Energizer double are like 2450 milliamps. Interesting. The Duracells are also low self-discharge nickel metal hydrides, which means they hold their charge extremely well. Like after six months, they should still have 90% of their charge. A lot of folks are loving Sanyo's Eneloop batteries, and the local ham radio shops where it's by PowerX for all their little 92 AA uh, handheld batteries on that one. So those are a couple brands for you to check out. Out. If you've actually, I, I, I gotta say, I haven't had any trouble running standard Energizer rechargeables in any device I've tried them in. So if they're not working at your house, I'm thinking everything in Canada must be much stricter about voltages. <laughs> 
Oh, Canada. <laughs> Blame Canada. So, hey, can we just agree to call them the batteries of NIM? <laughs> From now on, only if you sing the song. Because I'm really tired of saying nickel metal hydride. Nim. 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 That's close, right? The Knights of Nim. Yeah. All right. We're just gonna <laughs> say that. All right. And next email is from Jim. Jim writes: Last week you put down using Time Machine for backup. Could you be a little more specific? I have Time Machine running, but except for one file deleted and error, I haven't had to use it. I have read the Time Machine section in David Pogue's The Missing Manual, Leopard, and according to the book, Time Machine can be used for recovering an entire hard drive, recovering to another Mac, or anything in between. So, what is the real problem? Well, Jim, I've had several friends have minor or major problems with Time Machine. Lost files, failure to restore after backup, or a failure to actually back up the files properly, which they didn't find out until their hard drive and their notebook crashed, and they went to restore from Time Machine and discovered that the Time Machine created backups that weren't actually functional. Mm -hmm. So I don't recommend, and you've actually, you have friend, mm -hmm. friends that have had the same experience. So with all due respect to David Pogue, who's missing manuals, I love, just because in theory something works doesn't mean it actually works in reality. A lot of people, and I'm sure I'm going to get a thousand emails. Oh, I'm sure that tons of people have been having it fine. But you know, I've, I've, I know a lot of highly technical people who have not been able to recover a hard drive yeah. via Time Machine. And they're not hacking things. They're not screwing around by modifying. They're they're using Time Machine the way Time Machine was designed to be used by Apple, and they've had massive issues. Roger, actually, our very own Roger Chang has had some particularly bad experiences. His entire Time Machine backup was unable to restore anything to a newly installed hard drive after the current version, or his current hard drive died because of file vault encryption Ooh. issues. So he, he thought he had a backup, or he does have a backup, but it doesn't really matter because Time Machine wouldn't restore the files. Look, you're better off using something like Carbon Copy Cloner. It's free, it's a little more robust, and it's capable of creating a bootable copy of an entire drive. Less system overhead, and it, you know the resulting backups have always worked for Roger and for me and for just about everyone else we know that uses Carbon Copy Cloner. Call me crazy, I'm not buying into Time Machine, and a lot of people I know who did buy Time Machines are very sad for it. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. sorry. I mean, Apple, iPod, use it all day. iPhone, I'm kind of getting happy with it again now that I can actually use it to make calls <laughs> <laughs> in San Francisco. Time Machine, I'm not feeling any measurable love for. All right. Well, mm. one last question from Matt in Monticello, Arkansas. Matt writes, could you suggest a method for clearing a hard drive of all my data before I sell my PC, or would it be better to buy a new hard drive for the PC? All right. Well, Matt, everyone should wipe their hard drive before selling, trading, or donating a PC to charity. We recommend Derek's Boot and Nuke. It's a free download from www.dban.org. Just download the ISO, burn it to a CDR to create a boot disk. CD Burner XP is great for this. Then set your PC to boot from the optical drive, toss in your copy of DBAN, and select the drive you want to wipe. And if you're not completely into the voodoo, fire up the quick erase, a single pass of random ones and zeros over your drive, or the Department of Defense short wipe, which is three passes. If you've got a Cordua processor, you'll need the DBAN 2.0 pre-release to get the full performance, according to the DBAN people. By the way, if you think you need a Gutman wipe, which is 35 passes, which even Gutman doesn't think is necessary, you should pull the drive out of the machine and melt it into an ingot over a forge and use it as a paperweight. Or get all legendary British Secret Service and grind the hard drive into dust and store it in your basement. Like with a cheese grater? Could you do that? You could. Oh. Or a grinding wheel. Interesting. Have you ever seen one of the hard drive shredding machines that they sell for big no, industrial applications? I haven't. It's 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 like can you shred it? Only it's like a wood chipper designed to, to inhale hard drives and exhale little tiny pieces of stuff. Amazing. It is amazing. What do babies, porn, and the army have in common? They're all in this week's episode of Raffle, the funniest show on the internet. Internet, bringing you the best stand-up comedy from around the world every Monday on revision3.com slash waffle. There is some funny stuff there. Check it out. Mm -hmm. And for everybody watching, we live in your questions, so email us, techzilla at revision3.com. Tech help, product reviews, how-tos, you ask us, we'll do it. But we need your emails to do it, so don't be shy. Send them in to techzilla at revision3.com. Even better, send us in a video question. Think of all the fun you can have and the admiration of all your friends and family when they see your mug on our show. Just keep it to 15 seconds, upload it to YouTube, and send us a link in an email with video question in the subject line. And as always, you can visit our forums at revision3.com slash forum. Share your thoughts, ideas, or comments with other fans of the show. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Veronica Belmont. Till next week, you've been watching Exilla.
I'm contagious, right, like a virus. <laughs> Are you ready? Veronica Belmont is a virus. Three, like two. chlamydia. <laughs> God. How do you get your beer cold certified? Sorry. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> His one job is to slide the beer. Kiss my ass. How do you get your beer cold certified? Check out the project Cold Experiments at What? How do you get your beer cold certified? <laughs> We're always bad at this one. How do you get your beer cold certified? <laughs> Check out the project Cold Experiments at Cold. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Variety of tools that mimic real canvas and evil painting. <laughs> you know, that was painted with real evil. <laughs> Try to find out whether or not all the hubbub around.